Guarding the western end of Westminster Bridge, in the shadow of Big Ben, stands the statue of Bodicea. Symbolizing the very spirit of Britain, this statue was the work of Thomas Thornycroft. His son, John I. Thornycroft, expressed the British spirit in another way, becoming a leading shipbuilder, whilst it was his grandson, now Sir John E. Thornycroft, who 50 years ago conceived the idea of building a steam road vehicle. Work on it was begun in a studio at Chiswick, in which the plaster cast of the statue was stored, and it was beneath the flying hooves of Bodicea's steeds that the Thornycroft No. 1 van took shape. The success of Thornycroft since constructing light high-speed machinery for boats was reflected in this one-ton vehicle with its marine water tube boiler and vertical launch type engine. It was probably the first example of the front wheel drive, now considered the most up-to-date form of transmission. Every part had to be specially made, many from unsuitable material, and rubber tyres for the wheels were unthought of. Nevertheless, it fully justified its designer's confidence and rarely earned its reputation as Britain's first successful self-propelled vehicle. Despite opposition from many quarters, the steam wagon had come to stay, and during the next few years, first at Chiswick and later at Basingstoke, were built vehicles for goods, for municipal services, and even for passengers. This bus, with its canopy to prevent cinders falling on the upper deck passengers, was running in London in 1902. The War Office, too, welcomed the steam wagon. And of those which went to South Africa, Lord Kitchener said, the motor lorries did well, Thornycrafts are the best. In 1902, the introduction of the internal combustion engine changed the shape of road transport and vehicles began to assume something of the appearance we know today. The military authorities developed an antipathy to petrol as fuel for anything but cars, so paraffin engine vehicles and tractors were introduced by Thornycrofts with much success. About this time, the company entered the private car field, and this two-cylinder, ten-horsepower vehicle with bevel-driven rear axle, was one of the earliest built. Larger types followed, and many successes were gained in competitive trials. By 1912, the commercial side of the business had assumed such proportions that car manufacture was discontinued. It was the Great War which gave mechanical transport its biggest boost and gave Thornycrafts their famous J lorry, of which over 5,000 were built for the services. From 1919, large numbers were supplied for commercial use, and this one recently arrived back at the works after 27 years of brewery transport. The company's next success was the introduction in 1926 of the rigid six-wheeler, in which twin-driven rear axles, moving independently of each other, provided an ideal method of driving cross-country vehicles. Primary design for military transport, this 30 hundredweight vehicle was particularly suitable for service in undeveloped countries where roads were bad or did not exist, whilst it could carry nearly double the load on made-up roads. A difference of 9 inches in axle levels is possible, whilst either axle can tilt to an angle of 13 degrees, corresponding to a difference in wheel levels of approximately 12 inches without adversely affecting the springs. Mud, water and sand present no difficulties to these vehicles. In fact, they are extremely useful to have on hand when four-wheelers fail to make the grade. Types have since been developed with equal success, and the latest, the eight-ton Amazon, is being used abroad in large numbers for both goods and passenger transport.
despite official restrictions, road transport progressed apace, with Thornycrofts well to the fore. And the next milestone was the introduction in 1936 of the Sturdy. This type has achieved even greater popularity than the J, for there is hardly a trade or industry in which it is not represented, and few countries abroad to which it has not been shipped. Starting its career as a 4-5 tonner, it soon demonstrated its capacity for heavier duty, whereupon it was strengthened to appear as a 5-6 tonner. Three lengths of wheelbase are provided, for lorries, vans and the like, for tippers, and for tractors to use with semi-trailers whilst either oil or petrol engine can be supplied with each. Since the first Sturdy went into service, several thousands have been supplied for civilian and military use, and the number of orders in hand is striking evidence of its popularity. Two years after the number one vehicle was built, the Thornycroft Steam Wagon Company, as it was then known, moved to Basingstoke. And from this small collection of buildings, the works has grown until it now covers more than a third of a site of 60 acres. Fully equipped with costly and highly specialized machine tools and an expert designing staff, it aims to produce its own parts wherever possible, thus giving the vehicles the individuality for which they are noted. During the Second World War, about 1,000 tons of materials a month entered the works and a similar quantity will be needed to keep pace with post-war production plans. All of this must be vetted by the laboratories and inspection staff, who are armed with the most modern equipment and precision instruments amongst which is an X-ray apparatus, with which few works are equipped, to detect flaws in castings and the like. Manufacture is on the flow principle in which the chassis assembly line is fed from the machine lines and sub-assembly sections, and at every stage, careful inspection ensures that the high quality is maintained. On completion, every chassis is subjected to extended road tests, equivalent to the normal running in period, so that every Thornycraft is delivered in fit condition for immediate service with full load, irrespective of operating conditions. The prosperity of Basingstoke is bound up with that of the works, and the men and women of this thriving town are proud of the productions which their efforts have helped to create, especially the gigantic output of munitions during wartime. More than 13,000 four- and six-wheeled vehicles were built for every conceivable purpose. Searchlight units, load carriers, survey vehicles, workshop lorries, water carriers, and photographic vans amongst others. One of the most interesting was this four-wheel driven Nubian, which can carry a three-ton load and haul four tons over the roughest surfaces. Another noteworthy vehicle was the mobile crane, of which nearly 2,000 were supplied to the Royal Air Force. This combination of the Thornycroft Amazon six-wheeler and a Coles crane rendered yeoman service at home and abroad in maintenance work and the recovery of crashed aircraft. Its ability to cross ground inaccessible to the ordinary four-wheeler makes this vehicle ideal for the job, and a number were fitted with a rope and pulley device 
which enabled them to retrieve objects out of reach of the crane's normal range. It's of interest to recall that during the Battle of Britain, the manufacture of these mobile cranes carried high priority, as they were the quickest and easiest means of removing the crashed and burnt out German aircraft, which were interfering with road and railway communications. Eight thousand two hundred and thirty machine gun carriers also were built. No better organization than Thornycrafts, with their unique experience of land and water transport, could have been chosen to develop Britain's amphibia. Known as Terrapin One, it's a shore-going craft in contrast to the conventional sea-going motor vehicle. It was capable of carrying five-ton loads at six miles an hour afloat could negotiate sand and shingle beaches of one in six gradients and attained 40 miles an hour on good roads. Some hundreds were built and did valuable work in Normandy, Holland and on the Rhine. In 1944, a larger version, Terrapin II, was produced of increased carrying capacity and able to climb one in three gradients. But the end of the war prevented its being used on active service. was enlisted in the production of guns, which resulted in 670 sets of two-pounders, 1,700 sets of 17-pounders, thousands of breech rings, blocks and firing mechanisms, and parts for the six-pounder anti-tank gun cap. Side lights in this massive output were 11,000 connecting rods for engines for tank landing craft, no small contribution to the success of invasion operations throughout the world. Fifteen thousand sets of torpedo rudders and equipment for both aerial and marine torpedoes. Thousands of balance weights and other parts for aero engines. And last but not least, the Thornycroft depth charge thrust. First produced in the Great War, it increased tenfold, according to expert opinion, the effectiveness of the depth charge. No wonder it has been the standard anti-submarine weapon in the British and other navies for more than 25 years. transport has come a long way since 1896 and this ancient vehicle is not only a tribute to Thornycroft workmanship but a monument to those pioneers whose vision and efforts helped to found the world's largest industry and conferred on mankind a boon of inestimable worth.